Shalom, brethren. My name is Jessica Vermeil of Ambassadors for Christ Ministries online social media team. Pastor Jay will be out for a few weeks, so he has handpicked a few sermons that we are going to be re-watching together. I pray that you um, continue to be edified and continue to learn in this path and journey to the Lord. Um, I pray that he comes back quickly, <laughs> and I know you guys do too. Uh, so see you soon. Take care. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Welcome to Pippi Long Stocking from Macon, Georgia. I guess you're a first timer. Welcome. We are glad to have you with us. And again, all the regulars, I don't have time to call all the names because of the time factor. But surely it's a privilege to be joining with all of you as one family in the Lord. May God be the glory. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Praise and honor and glory to you, the Most High God, Yehovah, Yahweh. Our God, the true God of the universe, among all the gods, you alone are God. Thank you, Father, we can come into your presence and we do so by permission of your Son, our Savior, our Lord, our High Priest and our King, Jesus the Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. Thank you that we can. It's another Sabbath day. Thank you that we can gather together and worship. And Father, as always, we are praying right now as the body of Christ, Lord, to reach the world, to reach people in every many nations of the earth and one day to reach every nation of the earth with this precious message father give me the clarity and the humility and the love and the spiritual authority to teach your word without spin without agenda just your agenda and your agenda alone and may each person who is hearing receive your intended message may you strengthen every believer father we have entered very difficult prophetic times where the whole world will suffer and to some extent christians do will suffer that's your word that's prophetic we cannot change that we can never cancel what your word has already declared so it must be it will come to pass so bless this message may this message go forth uninterrupted unhindered uncensored and reach many people across the nations of the earth Father, we just commit now this time of studying your word into your care, giving you the praise and the honor and the glory in that name above every name, Jesus, Yeshua. And all of God's people say, Amen, Amen, and Amen. To God be the glory again. Always we say, Praise God, praise God, and praise God. You can never grow weary of praising God, and I hope you never will grow weary of praising God because He alone is worthy to be praised. Amen. All right, well, Shabbat Shalom. Welcome again to all. Back in October last year, I began a series of sermons uh, titled Biblical Heroes of Faith. Biblical Heroes of Faith. And I promise you I will do one per month because I have about 20 names to cover. And that was in October. So we had October, November, December. In October, I covered Jeremiah. In November, I covered Elijah. And in December, I covered Mary. So those are the three one, three persons we have covered today i want to continue one per month only daniel biblical heroes of faith number four part four daniel let me just for clarification purposes explain i am not doing the biblical heroes of faith in any particular order chronologically or any order for that matter if i were doing it in order i would start in the book of genesis i did not i started with jeremiah elijah mary now daniel i am doing these 20 names as the spirit leads based on certain things as God shows me and I feel appropriate. But all of them are important. All of them are important. Amen. I can't do all 20 in one shot. That doesn't make sense either. So it's one per month, only one per month. Hopefully, if I do that by the end of this year, that will bring me to, no, let's see, 
12, 14, 16, yeah, but 16, and then we'll do another three or four more uh, next year, God willing. Amen. But you're going to be encouraged. You're going to be inspired. Amen. So why? Why am I doing the series? There are three questions. Three questions. Let's put those questions on the on the screen for you. Question one. Why should we study biblical heroes of faith? Why should we study biblical heroes of faith? Well, for two reasons. One, most obvious, they're in the Bible. Anything in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is worth studying. Amen. Why study biblical heroes of faith? Because they are examples for us. When we look back in the past, starting with Genesis, and we look at God's heroes of faith, men and women, who were challenged, who were persecuted, but who stood faithful to God, that encourages us, that empowers us to do what we have to do and stand strong. Because we too are going to experience some very difficult times, especially as we draw closer to the end of the age. And again, I want to remind everybody, you can cancel God's plan. Let me be emphatically, dogmatically clear. No human being has the power to cancel God's plan. If you could cancel God's plan, then you are greater than God. So give me your name. I'll have to worship you. Okay. Question number two. What makes Daniel a hero of faith? Obviously, if I use a name, we have to see what specific things in his life stand out to make him, that we can put him in God's hall of fame. Daniel is in God's hall of fame. And I do want to make an observation here. Unless you're in God's hall of fame, any other hall of fame is worthless. You can be in man's hall of fame and you can receive a billion dollars and you can own half of the world. And all of that is useless until you are in God's hall of fame. Question three. Amen. Question three. What spiritual lessons should we learn and apply from Daniel's example? Obviously. So it's not just for us to study the example of Daniel. What lessons are applicable to us today? You're not Daniel. I am not Daniel. And God didn't call you to be Daniel. And God didn't call me to be Daniel. So that's another uh, theological mistake people make. God says, people say, God called you to be Daniel. God didn't call you to be Daniel, but you can be like that. There is a difference, okay? God didn't call you to be Moses, but you can be like Moses. Learning from Moses, learning from Daniel, and applying the relevant lessons. Do I hear an amen to that? All right. Okay, this is going to be a very big subject. Let me explain a few things again from background. I am not covering Daniel as a Bible study here, okay? I already did that in a series of Bible studies they did where I covered the entire book of Daniel. I'm not dealing with Daniel here today in the prophetic, all the prophecies of Daniel. That's not the purpose. That will take sessions upon sessions upon sessions. My main focus is Daniel as a biblical hero of faith. Keep it in mind. I like to be very specific so people understand where I'm going. Sometimes people talk and they go around in circles. No, I don't do that. I am very specific what I'm going to do and how I'm going to get it done. At the end of this message, you will understand who Daniel was and why he is a hero of faith and what lessons are applicable to you. Do it here. Amen. So let me give you the background. Before we get into the scripture in Daniel, you need some very important background because this is critical. Without this background, the story of Daniel doesn't really make much sense, except it's a nice story. It's a good bedtime story for the children. No, this is powerful beyond words, okay? The prophet Jeremiah, and I'm dealing uh, right now, as you know, I'm doing the Bible course with you in Jeremiah every Wednesday night. The prophet Jeremiah, whom God had called to witness and to warn Judah of the destruction that was coming from the Babylonians. So Daniel lived during the time of Jeremiah's prophecy. For all you know, Daniel was there. Daniel must have heard. I don't know. But Daniel, as you will see. So Daniel would have heard the prophecies of Jeremiah. He would have read the prophecies of Jeremiah. In fact, he said so. All right. So as the prophet Jeremiah had prophesied, the nation of Judah was going to collapse. It was going to be invaded and conquered by the Babylonians. The, prof the prophecy was set in motion. It could no longer be stopped. I've made that very clear. Jeremiah makes that very clear. And if you want to understand more of that, you should do the Bible course in Jeremiah, which I'm currently doing every Wednesday night. So I want to encourage those of you who are new to this Saturday message. Every Wednesday night, I am covering right now the Bible course in Jeremiah. This is a college level course, very scholastic, 
but very theologically sound. Amen. Now, did God keep his word? Well, of course he did. That is God. If God said, I'm going to destroy a nation, he will destroy the nation. So the destruction of the southern kingdom, Judah, came in three waves. Three waves. Let me give you the three waves in terms of time. First wave began in the king Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon in the year 605 BC. 605 BC was wave number one. King Nebuchadnezzar invaded. But he didn't complete the invasion. In the first wave of the invasion, in the first invasion, 605 BC, Daniel was captured. Daniel, along with his three friends, whom we know, and I'll talk about them shortly, they were captured, plus many other young people were captured from Jerusalem and other parts of Judah and deported to Babylon. Very important. Very important. At the time of Daniel's capture, he must have been um, a teenager, 15 or 16 years of age. He wasn't an old man, okay? Keep that in point. The second wave of the invasion occurred in 597 B.C. 597 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar returned. But it wasn't complete until the third wave. The third wave of the invasion of the Babylonian invasion of the southern kingdom of Judah occurred in 587, 586 B.C. when Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was destroyed. That completed the prophecy with regard to the conquest of Judah for their sin. Thousands upon thousands were killed, murdered, and thousands were deported. And among those thousands of deportees, Daniel was one of them, among others like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which was not their name. Okay, that's the Babylonian name. I'll come to that in a short while. Let me explain something here, very important to you to understand. It was King Nebuchadnezzar's governmental policy that when he would conquer a nation and bring the survivors into his homeland, he would take the brightest and the best, the younger ones, and he would train them for three years. It's like going to college. It's like going to university. You get it? Three years. Yeah. Three years of training. Three years of indoctrination. Three years of understanding Babylonian culture. After which, if they would pass the exam, right? There was an exam, so to speak. Then they would be allowed to serve the king to administer government. That was a very effective way of controlling all the conquered nations and peoples. It's politics. Nothing's wrong with that. That's how politics work. That's politics work. Politicians work. That's the way it was. Do I hear amen? Okay. So when we study, when we study the life of Daniel, in fact, the entire book of Daniel, there are two very critical things that will hit you immediately. One, the narratives in the book of Daniel serve two major purposes. There are other purposes, but the two major purposes, one, to, to give an outline of prophecy until the end. God would use the book of Daniel and the prophet Daniel to give an outline of world history, world prophecy, sorry, which will then become world history, from that time on until the end. That outline is in the book of Daniel. But that's not the purpose today. The purpose is second. The second purpose. To prove that the God of Judah, the God of Israel, to prove that YHVH, that's his name. I will keep on saying that every single day. The name of the God I worship is YHVH, not God. God is not a name. Every nation has gods. The Babylonians had gods, but their gods were not God, Yahovah. Amen. So it was to prove that Yahovah is the only true God. It reminds us of what happened in the days of Moses and Pharaoh. What did God do to Pharaoh? God proved to the Egyptians and to the Pharaoh of Egypt that the God of Moses, YHVH, is the only true God. Why was this important? Well, remember this. In ancient civilizations, when a nation was conquered, as was the case of Judah, then the conquerors and all the other nations who would have observed the conquest of Judah would come to the obvious conclusion that the God or gods of the conquered nation were weak. Which therefore meant, from the Babylonian perspective and from the perspective of all those who would be observers, Judah's God was no God at all. What can a weak God with this serving? Are you, are you getting this? 
keep the perspective. When you understand the historical and theological and spiritual perspective, you will see why Daniel is an amazing hero of faith. So Daniel was thrust into a, to a whole new world from Jerusalem to Babylon, from a practicing Jew to a nation that didn't recognize the God of the Jews, the God of the Jews. And he, with his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were registered under King Nebuchadnezzar's orders, registered in the Royal Academy of Cultural Assimilation. They were going to get their PhD in politics and government of how to govern Babylon. Hmm. Listen well, uh, making the background very clear. The clearer the background, the easier the rest will follow. Amen. What are we talking about today? Biblical heroes of faith, Daniel. How was Daniel a hero of faith? Well, get ready. This is going to be exciting. Very exciting. And you're going to see the applicability of Daniel's life back then. We're talking uh, many years ago now. Remember when Daniel, Daniel was conquered or, or, or deported in what year? 605 BC. That's 600 years before Christ. When Daniel was, became a deportee, a captive, he was only 15 or 16 years old. By the time of Daniel's end of his life, he was an old man. When we get to the story, as we will in a short while, Daniel in the lion's den. He was no longer a 16-year-old or 25-year-old. No, by the time Daniel was cast into the lion's den, he was 83 years old. Did you get it? He had served faithfully in the political administration of Babylon under King Nebuchadnezzar and the ones who followed King Nebuchadnezzar. And thereafter, when the Persian Empire routed and invaded the Babylonians. And yet he was retained as a political administrator. Why? All of these things are important. See, there are many Christians who don't understand. There are many Christians who are very ignorant of biblical history and theology. I'm not saying that to say they're not Christian, okay? But there is ignorance. Let's call, we're not all equally educated, okay? Please understand that. We have this nonsensical approach. We're all equal. We're not equal. That's, that's foolishness. God has given us different gifts, different abilities, different skills, different levels of knowledge, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Do I amen to that? That's God. So we're not equal. We're equal only in one sense. We are equal sinners who will be going to hell but for the sacrifice of Christ. Do I hear amen to that? <laughs> amen and amen. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. Okay. So, are we ready for this? Let's pick it up in Daniel chapter 1. Now, now that I've given you the background, I hope I have enough time to cover this message, but you're going to be really, this. you need this message. I'm telling you right now, you need to hear this message. It's urgent. It's very urgent. Watch and learn from the example of Daniel. Daniel chapter 1, I begin, I'll read a few verses there, and again, I will not be covering all 12 chapters of Daniel, that's inconceivable, because it's not a Bible course on Daniel, it's a sermon, hero of faith, Daniel. Let's understand the background from Daniel chapter 1, verse 3 to verse 10, I'm going to just read this very quickly, uh, the scriptures will be, will be on the screen for you, and I will give you further in-depth explanation. Here we go. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men, young men, <laughs> young men, not old men, young men. There it is in the Bible, young men, in whom there was no blemish. Good looking, not ugly. I'm sorry. The Bible says good looking men. That's a fact. But good looking, gifted. Gifted in all wisdom. Hmm. Do you see how smart King Nebuchadnezzar was? A gifted young man. Good looking man. Gifted in wisdom. Yeah. Possessing knowledge. Mm -hmm. And quick to understand. Who had the ability. I mean, just look at the word, verse 4. That's a whole sermon there. So were those everybody? No. These, were, these had to be screened. 
So the eunuch Ashpenaz had to screen all the deportees, all those who were coming into Babylon, and find those young men in whom there was no blemish, good looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, and quick to understand, and who had the ability to serve in the king's palace, whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. I'm going to talk a lot about that, but let's move on because I'm raring to go on this. Hallelujah. So, where was I? Uh, at whom they might, okay, verse next, verse, verse five. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them. Highlight three years. How long was the training? Not one week, not one month, not one year, three years. I say that for a good reason. Some people think they can go to a one week Bible course and they become a, a Bible teacher. <laughs> it's it's totally it's, it's madness what's happening in the world today. Okay, three years of training, three years of training for them, so that so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now, from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Did you get it? Those were the names. Those were their names. Those were the Hebrew names, right? They had Hebrew names. Which in English, that's what the names are. But to them, the chief of the eunuchs gave the names to Daniel. He gave the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, he gave the name Shadrach. And to Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. I'll explain that shortly. But Daniel, ah, verse 8, here we go. But, there's the big but. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, God had brought Daniel into favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king who has appointed your food and drink. For why would he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. You would endanger my head before the king. All right, let's take those verses off. Let me put this in perspective. So, Daniel, Shadrach, Daniel, Mish, Shadrach. No, let's get it right in. Daniel, Daniel, Mishael, um, Hananiah, Azariah, three young Jewish lads, 15, 16, 17, give or take a year or two. They were enrolled in the Royal Academy. For what purpose? To study Hebrew? No. To study Judaism? No. To study Jehovah? No. They were enrolled in Nebuchadnezzar's Royal School of Royal Academy in Babylon for one purpose to be totally indoctrinated in Babylonian culture, Babylonian religion, the Babylonian language, the Babylonian totality. Why? Because unless they were indoctrinated in that system, they could not effectively represent the Babylonian Empire. Read between the lines now. Read between the lines. Do I need to spell that out for you to apply today? Hmm. Think, think, think. Are you thinking? Most people don't think. Others think for them. Sorry. I can say a lot about myself here. God has given me the ability to think. I have studied. I have traveled. I have done so much research in my life. I think. I will not be indoctrinated by the world. Are you getting it? So they were going to be indoctrinated. Part of the indoctrination required that they would have to eat the king's selected foods. Aha. Uh -huh. Problem challenge number one. They already were there. Their names were changed. Why do you think the names were changed from Hebrew names to Babylonian names? Because part of the indoctrination required a change of identity. So Belteshazzar, Daniel means what God is my judge. El, Elohim, Elohim is my judge. That's Hebrew. Daniel. His name was changed to Belteshazzar 
which Bel will protect you. Who is Bel? One of the Babylonian gods. His three friends, his three friends, their names will also change. Hananiah to Shadrach, Mishael to Meshach, Azariah to Abednego. All those names are references to the Babylonian gods. So the change of name, the hope was from King Nebuchadnezzar, by changing their name, they would change the identity and they would change the affiliation and they would assimilate the Babylonian culture. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Not for Daniel. No, no, no. Daniel said, oh, listen up, Ashpenazim. Sir, with all due respect, I remember Ashpenaz was the chief of the eunuchs, so Ashpenaz was an administrator working for King Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel showed great respect. In fact, the Bible says he had favor with Ashpenaz, which implied that um, Daniel and his friends were not rude, disrespectful, little entitled brats as we have today. No, rudeness gets you nowhere. One of the problems we have to understand in this world, when you're rude, you should be punished. Daniel was respectful. He was very civil. He was very courteous. I can only imagine with great respect he came to Ashpenaz and said, Sir, um, we got a little problem. And I'm sure you will understand what I'm saying here. You know, we are Jews and we don't really eat that food. Some people call Daniel, the, the foolishness of people, it, it, it irks me. I have read pastors, great celebrity pastors who say, Daniel chapter 1, verse verse um, whatever verse we are in here is a Daniel fast. Total nonsense. Okay. Daniel wasn't fasting. Daniel said, I'm a Jew. I don't eat certain foods. That's my religion. That's what the Bible said for them. You and I are different. We're not Jews. But understand the story in context. Don't read a story without context. So Daniel said, no, we, we, we don't eat that food. And furthermore, we don't eat foods sacrificed to idols. Because again, that was part of the culture. Understand, it was part of the culture, pagan culture. Basically, Daniel and his friends were saying, listen, we really appreciate your, your good nature towards us and your kindness towards us. You want to give us the king's best food. But the problem is this. <clears throat> we don't really eat that stuff. They had that right. Now, do you realize what that could have cost for Daniel? At that moment, Ashpenaz could have said, if you refuse to eat the king's food, we're going to expel you from the college, one. We'll kick you out, right? We'll throw you out in the, the streets. Worse than that, we will we'll kill you. You dare to defy King Nebuchadnezzar? But the very fact that um, the Bible says he found favor with Ashpenaz shows that you already had established a good relationship. He wasn't a rude human being. These arrogant little brats walking around America and the world. No, no. Respectful. And God honored that. Daniel was going to be faithful to his God, Yehovah, and his religion as a Jew. That's important. Faithfulness to God. And that faithfulness to God was going to get him in trouble. Just faithfulness to his God, Yahweh, Yehovah would get him into big trouble, but his faith in this God would get him out of trouble. Did you get it yet? Let me repeat that. Faithfulness to his God would get him into trouble, but faith in his God would bring about deliverance. Faith in his God. Wow. Powerful story. So for three years, they went through the indoctrination process. Three years learning the language and the culture and the religion and practicing many things. But Daniel and his friends remain, oh, three friends. Now think for a moment. The Bible doesn't identify others, okay? So it would, pre we can presume that the others are from Judea who were captive from Judah, that they said, you know what? That's all right. We'll, we, we'll eat the food sacrificed to idols and we'll eat the pigs and we'll eat the other stuff that's unclean. It doesn't matter. We want to survive. For them, for the others, perhaps survival was more important. For Daniel and his friends, it wasn't survival. It was faithfulness to their covenant God. Faithfulness to their covenant God. Faithfulness to their covenant God. 
something that many Christians don't get yet. Oh, yeah. You can say whatever you want. This is my authority, the Holy Bible. I don't care what celebrity pastors or pa pastors who play politics in the pulpit. They're irrelevant to me. And I can say this with authority, irrelevant to God. I'll follow Daniel as an example. Go ahead, amen. Go ahead, amen. amen. So what happened? Amen. Well, Ashpenaz said, okay, Daniel, you know what? I will agree with you, even though I'm running a risk of my own life. Because you know what? If, I to, if, if, if you guys don't look good and things go bad, the king will perhaps fire, fire me for my job or even kill me. I could lose my life. I'm endangering my very head by granting your request. Daniel assured him, look, give us 10 days. I'll tell you what, give us 10 days. And after 10 days, let's see what happens. Give us the, veg the vegetables and the water we're asking for. We don't want all that fancy food. We don't need to be your five-star restaurants. We don't need you li living it up. No, we, we don't want that. We just want our permission to worship our God and eat the foods that he has ordained. You know what happened after 10 days? After 10 days, Daniel and his friends were looking better. And fatter, okay, and all fairer and healthier than all the others. So Ashpen has realized, hey, great, you know what? You guys are good to go for three years, no problem. Good to go for three years. What a powerful story. Are we learning anything yet? Faithfulness to God. God honored that faithfulness. Yehovah, their true God, honored their faithfulness. Story picks up momentum, and then we go. I don't have time to go through all of this, like I told you, because this is a lot of stuff here. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, chapter two. We will not go into that dream. I don't need to, not for the purposes of this message. The golden image, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we find something very important that Daniel is uh, that Nebuchadnezzar is de decides to kill all his magicians and astrologers who were well-trained, they had been to the Royal Academy of Babylonian nonsense, but they couldn't interpret the dream. So guess what? Daniel is called. Let's pick this up in Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, verse 26. Daniel chapter 2, verse 26. So now he's a bit older, okay? Verse 26 to verse 28. Let's read this. Amazing story. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Good question, right? By the king. The astrologers and the magicians and all the ones who were learned in the Chaldean skills of magic and whatever stuff, demonism, they couldn't do it. And their lives were now in danger. And Daniel's life was in danger too because he was considered one of the wise men there. So he said, whoa, 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 hold it, hold it. He, he spoke to uh, Ariak who was uh, appointed to destroy the wise men. Ariak was appointed to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. I mean, these kings didn't take it easy. You couldn't interpret the dream. You couldn't tell me the dream. Off with your heads. You know, you were worthless and useless. Verse 27. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, now watch carefully what Daniel said. We can learn. The secret which the king has demanded the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers, they cannot declare to the king. King Nebuchadnezzar, all your learned men, even though they have PhDs and DDs and whatever are Ds, they're all dead men now because they don't have the ability to tell you the dream, no interpret the dream. But Daniel didn't say, but I do. Notice verse 28. But there is a God. There is a God in heaven. What is one of the purposes for the book of Daniel? To reveal the superiority of the God of Daniel. Yehovah. Here was King Nebuchadnezzar and all the other Babylonians thinking that the God of Judah was weak. Ha! On the contrary, only Yehovah could reveal it. There is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And he has made, he, this God, Yehovah, has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar, has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. 
And then Daniel went in to explain the dream and the vision and, and interpret it. Isn't that amazing? Now, do you get it? Let's stop there and move on here. Watch. Let's learn from Daniel. Daniel could have said, Oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, I am so glad to be in your presence. And you know, you're a bunch of people, they're losers. They're a bunch of nobodies and no goods. But I am a smart guy. I got it all figured out. I am a dream scholar. I could tell you the dream. He could have taken credit for himself. He didn't do that. He publicly praised his God. Some of us are afraid to do that, right? If you're ashamed of Christ, you finish the rest. If you're ashamed of Christ, finish the rest. Okay. So here is Daniel, still a young man, standing before the king and saying, Oh, king, listen, there is a God, the God I worship. Let's try to fill this out, flesh it out. You see that when you came to Judah and you conquered us and you thought you conquered our God, but you did not conquer our God. You conquered us because our God warned us this would happen if we failed him. So my God, Jehovah, he is the one who understands all things. He is the one who can reveal the dream and he will. And I'll tell you what your dream was. And I'll tell you the exact meaning of that dream. I'll interpret the dream for you. King Nebuchadnezzar must have been awestruck, impressed. We know the story goes, and we don't have time to go into Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but we know they took their stand and they said, they're not going to worship the image. They would not bow down to the image. So we see in the book of Daniel, not just the example of Daniel as a hero of faith. We see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? The, the three Hebrew lads also, uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And by the way, Azariah, that's the name of my son. That name means God is my helper. God is my helper. Okay, so we see them taking a stand and telling the king, no, we will not bow down to your image. Nope, sorry, will not do. And we know the rest of that story, <laughs> right? We know the rest of that story. They were thrown into a fiery furnace. And the fourth man, Christ, appeared and saved them. Saved. They, their faith got them into, their, their faith, their faithfulness got them into trouble. But their faith in Jehovah got them out of trouble. Deliverance. Amen. Are we getting the point yet? Wow. You better know the Bible, church. Those of you listening to me, you better know the Bible and share this with other people. There's too many weak Christians running around thinking they're saved. You're not saved. Where's the salvation? Because you said, you said some sinners pray, dear Lord, I, re I receive Christ as Savior. Until the Holy Spirit lives in you, you're not saved. And when the Holy Spirit lives in you, you have power. Power! Not just to talk. Power to do. Power to obey. Power to bring down strongholds. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. Am I preaching it? That's what it's about. And we see Daniel's, Daniel's example. We see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's examples. Hallelujah. But we go stay focused on um, Daniel. So chapter 3. We move on to chapter 3. Yep. We see the example of, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We move on. The story moves on. Daniel is getting older. Things are happening. And um, again, because of time, I've got to move very quickly. I want to move now into Daniel chapter 6. When we get to Daniel chapter 6, by this time, Nebuchadnezzar is gone. And Belshazzar, Belshazzar is the reigning monarch. And he is a, a stubborn mule. Belshazzar didn't want to heed the warnings of Daniel. He was proud and arrogant like his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. But Nebuchadnezzar was humble. We know that. But Belshazzar wasn't. And so Daniel warned him what was going to happen. But Belshazzar did not repent. So what happened? That very night, the handwriting on the wall. The handwriting on the wall said, Mene, mene, teku uparsin. Your kingdom is divided. It's over for you. It's over for you. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. That very night, the Bible says that very night, uh, Daniel chapter 5, verse 30, you don't have to go there. That very night, that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. That night in history was October 12th. October 12th, 539 B.C. That's historically documented. October 12th, 
539 BC. The Babylonian kingdom fell in that night. Gone. Who took over? The Persians. Now the story gets excited because I'm going to show you something. When Cyrus took over, well, um, Cyrus became the king of, he was the king of Persia, but you're going to see the name da da Darius or Darius. Either pronunciation is correct from what I've studied. Um, Darius was like a co-ruler with Cyrus. So Darius, that's the name. Obviously, the word was on the street and through the official circles and through the documentation in the palaces that this man, Daniel, was an esteemed administrator. Recognize a man of excellence and skill, integrity, wisdom, trustworthy. And so D Darius wanted to retain the services of Daniel. He wasn't going to throw away a man who had proven his worth. He wasn't going to throw away a man whom the story would have documented, was able to speak wisdom to King Nebuchadnezzar and wisdom to King Belshazzar. All of that was documented. Think about it. God chooses wisely. What about you? Are you a person of wisdom and integrity and excellence? Should you be? Should you be? Well, you, you decide that. All right. So Daniel chapter 6. Let's pick up the story now. Verse 1 to verse 11. Um, you don't have to turn there. I'm just going to very quickly read this and explain a few things. These are critical for understanding Daniel's fate, Daniel's courage, Daniel's excellence, Daniel's uncompromising position. One of the things that stands out in the story here, and I'm going to summarize these points for you shortly, 12 summary statements. One of the things that stands out about Daniel is this. His faithfulness to God meant this. He did not compromise with any nonsense. He did not compromise with sin. He did not compromise with cultural assimilation. He didn't believe in religious pluralism. Something that many Christians and many pastors, quote unquote pastors, you cannot be a pastor. You cannot be a pastor. You cannot be a minister of Christ if you believe in pluralism. Did you understand that? Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Christ did not say, I am one of the many ways. That's pluralism. There are many parts to heaven. I'm just one of them. Christ never said those. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Cultural assimilation is unbiblical. Daniel proves it by his life. So Daniel is about to be put into a very difficult situation, even worse now. Now, that's the other age perspective. By the time the, the Babylonian Empire fell, that was 539 BC. Remember, Daniel was captured in 605 BC. So all this time had elapsed. So at the time of the incident recorded in Daniel chapter 6, Daniel must have been around 80 years old. We're not speaking of a young man, an old seasoned administrator, but an old faithful servant of Jehovah. Amen? Amen. Now, Amen. young or old, remember, Daniel had purpose in his heart. But remember in Daniel chapter 1, keep this point. Daniel had purpose in his heart. There was something, my dear brothers and sisters, about purposing in your heart. If you don't purpose it in your heart, it will not happen. Stop believing this foolishness that because God has called you, God will do everything for you. You have a responsibility not to be saved. That's God's responsibility. But if you want to be like Daniel, you have to purpose in your heart that you will do something or will not do something. Amen. Wow. That's why we have these stories. So. He must have been about 80 years of age. He had remained consistently faithful to his God, uncompromisingly faithful to his God, Jehovah, and to his Jewish religion, in spite of all of the attacks on him. And God gave him favor. Now, why did God give Daniel favor? Because Daniel was used by God to record the prophetic outline for the future. It was therefore critical for God to do that. So God gave him favor. Now, 
New King. Let's pick up the story. I'm going to read very quickly and expound. My time is going. I could wax long on this. Wow. It pleased Darius or Darius. I guess that both pronunciations are acceptable. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. And over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one. Ah, so Darius had 120 political leaders. They were not governors. They were administrative leaders, like having a Senate, okay? But over these 120, there were three top men, governors. Daniel was chosen to be one of the three. Now remember, Daniel is the Jew. Daniel was not a Mede or a Persian or a Babylonian. He was a Jew. The Medes and the Persians didn't like that. They had some racial problems. Racial problems? Did I say race? Race? Race has always been a problem. All right, Americans, wake up. Race has always been a problem. It wasn't invented in the USA. Always existed. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps. satraps. Because an excellent spirit was in him. Excellent. The spirit of excellence. Not the spirit of half-heartedness. No. Daniel wasn't average. Daniel was above average. He was excellent. He was excellent at what he was called and trained to do. So the king gave the thought. Watch where the problem begins now. The king gave the thought to setting him over the whole realm. So of the three governors, wow. it seemed as though King Darius, under Cyrus, of course, was about to give Daniel the position of being number one under himself, of course. Okay. That didn't come across nicely to the, the satraps and the others, governors and all the other leaders in the Medo-Persian Empire. It was like no way. Jealousy, envy crept in and they had to find a way to... Nail him. Take him, down. Take him down. Remove him from office. So they became conspirators. They had a conspiracy theory. huh? They were the real conspirators working for the devil. They conspired. They hatched a plot. They were plotters. They were devious. They were evil. They were disgustingly pathetic. They lied. They cheated because they hated Daniel. Ring, ring, ring. Think, think, think. Are you with me so far? Anybody listening? Yeah. Anybody getting it? Yes. Yeah. I hope you're getting the point. Yeah. I'm not mincing words here. Yeah? Uh, there are some things I should say, but I can't because you know what? <laughs> we now live in a world of censorship on, <clears throat> you know what? Boy, oh, but there's so much I want to say. <laughs> Praise God. All right. Let me hold my peace by just stick with the, the script here. Okay. So the governors and the satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. How can we bring up, how can we press a charge that can stick against him? Here's a man of integrity, a man who is not corrupt, a man who doesn't steal taxes. You know, the satraps were administered as tax administrators, basically. They were tax administrators. Tax, every, see, you don't like tax? Neither do I. They were tax administrators, but they were thieves. Not Daniel. Daniel was trustworthy. He wasn't going to steal one penny or one dime or one shekel or whatever coin they use. He was not going to steal one penny from the king. So they could find no charge against him because he was faithful. Faithful to his God. Being faithful to his God meant obedient to God's moral law. No nonsense. No corruption. No nepotism. No bribery, none of that. Uh, let's see, can we find anybody like that in the world today R ruling any nation? Mm, let's start thinking. Let's see. Me? Right. Impossible. Impossible. All right. So they said, um, there is no error in this man. So what do we do? He's 80 years old. His record is impeccable impeccable faultless you're not saying it was perfect in terms of sin no his record his administrative record was faultless and impeccable so they said aha we shall not find any charge against this daniel unless we find it 
against him concerning the law of his God. They knew that Daniel was such a man of integrity and so faithful to his God that he would not go against his God. So let's test him in an area where he will break. So what do they do? They conspire. They got together in a secret meeting without the press. Now, you've got to understand where I'm going with this, okay? Without the press. No press coverage here. No press release. This is a secret meeting, closed doors, no cameras, no social media here now. Listen up, guys. We've got to get him. How? And they began to brainstorm. Their evil brains were brainstorming. How are they going to do this? And they hit upon the brilliant idea. Hey, I know. Somebody has a great idea. I know exactly what to do. Let's get him on the subject of worshiping and praying to his God. Well, how? So somebody hit upon the bright idea. You know what? There it is. All the governors, they, 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 they throng the king, they were Darius, after plotting. And here's what they said to Darius. Sir, your honor, your majesty, the governors and the satraps, all the governors of the kingdom, which was a lie because Daniel was not consulted and he was number one, okay? All the governors of the kingdom and the administrators and satraps, the counselors and the advisors, so all of the administrative staff, all of the political leaders, this is what they're saying, have come together and we have unanimously decided, no exception, was a hundred to zero vote. We have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days, except you, whoever petitions any god, Except you, O king. 30 days. Yes, 30 days. They just wanted a window of opportunity. It wasn't forever. We would go back to normal after 30 days. But at least for 30 days, Daniel would have to make a decision which could cost him his life and therefore his position. So, king, anybody who disobeys you, we are asking you to pass a law. Such a person shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing. Look, we already have the papers for you. <laughs> it's already done. All you got to do is put your, hand, put your signature on it. And remember, king, as while you're signing this law, it can be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians. That was the law. Once the king signed it, it couldn't be unsigned. It couldn't be revoked. If the king signed it, done deal. King Darius had no clue he was being set up. He had no clue he was being deceived. He had no idea he was being manipulated by a bunch of evil, plotting, scheming, depraved human beings. They had no, he, they, he had no idea that they hated Daniel so much that Daniel was not consulted. He was under the illusion, and understandably so, that all the governors, including Daniel, had convened and agreed. But of course, Daniel wasn't there in the meeting. He signed it. Ah, okay. Let's see what Daniel would do now. Would Daniel obey the king? Would Daniel comply? All right, brethren, remember there is a time to comply and there's a time to defy. Let me repeat. There is a time as a Christian you will comply and there is a time when you must defy. A lot of Christians don't understand the difference. There's a time for compliance and there's a time for defiance. Use your brain. Guided by the Holy Spirit. Do I, I shake my head with a smile? <laughs> Remember what happened a few years ago in this world? Global? Globally? You know what's going to happen soon? Globally? Will you defy or comply? You choose. You choose, brothers and sisters. I don't choose for you. But I know what I will choose. I can say that right now. I have proven by my life. All right, here we go. When Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. So word leaked out to Daniel because they wanted Daniel to know. So they sent him an email message, <laughs> a text, okay? Hey, Daniel, guess what? I just want you to know that the king signed the law. Anybody who petitions any god except King Darius will be cast into the den of lions. Daniel 
shook his head and said, well done, guys. <laughs> so you have entrapped me. But guess what? Your entrapment doesn't change me. I will do exactly what I do every day. I will go home as I normally do after work, kneel down and pray to my God, Yah Yahovah. Mm -hmm. They knew. Mm -hmm. They knew that Daniel would not comply. That's the point. They knew that. They knew because they had seen the integrity of the man. So they knew he wouldn't comply. And they knew that once he defied, then he would have no choice. But Darius would have to cast him into the den of lions. And they knew that these lions would tear him up to pieces in no time at all. Bang. In a flash. End of Daniel. We don't want this Jew around us. Okay. Unfortunately, they were fighting not just Daniel. They were fighting the God of Daniel. Anybody who fights the God of Daniel is fighting the true God. Anybody who fights Christ, you're fighting true God also. I'm a Christian. I worship Christ. I serve Christ. You fight me, you fight Christ. How about that? Did you get it? Somebody say, praise the Lord. Somebody say, are you strong? Are you strong in the Lord? You better be. So he went home, and as his custom was, we went his windows open toward Jerusalem because that was the, cu the custom. All Jews, after deportation, since they were no longer in Jerusalem, it was the custom that when they pray, they would face Jerusalem, even till this day. So he faced Jerusalem. He knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks. He prayed and gave thanks. Daniel was a praying man. He prayed and he gave thanks. We don't know exactly what he prayed, but it's kind of obvious, right? What he would say. Dear God, Jehovah, thank you for this great job I have as a governor in this land. And thank you, Lord God Almighty, hallelujah, blessed be your name, that even though these men have done this against me, I know you are God. And if it is your will, you will deliver me from the lion's den. So said, huh? so done. All right, what happens now? These men assembled. They sent out their spies, or they themselves went and they surrounded Daniel's house or apartment or whatever it was, and they found him what praying and making supplication to his God Yehovah, to his God, not Bel, not Nebo, not Marduk, and not Darius, but Yehovah. And they went before the king and spoke. Concerning the king's decree, have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or any man within 30 days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? Uh-oh. Darius at that point realized he had been tricked. Too late. You can read the rest of the story. Read the rest of the story. We know the rest of the story? Well, very quickly, Darius was very very disappointed he tried every way to save daniel but the law had been signed he had no choice but a sad sad heart a broken spirit he said daniel basically i'm sorry i didn't know what happened here i was conned i was manipulated you know how much i love you daniel i am really sorry 80 years old or 83 he was thrown into the lion's den. Now, for your information, that was typical Persian justice. The Persian judicial system allowed for people to be thrown into a den of lions, to be mauled and eaten alive. That was the system. You don't like it? Sorry, that was the way it was. That night, Darius had no sleep. He tossed to and fro, back and forth. He could not sleep, not one wink of sleep. Because he knew that what he, did, what he did was wrong. He was about to lose his most important, most dependable, and most trustworthy administrator, Daniel. Amen. What a story. In fact, before he left, before he said goodbye to Daniel, he said, you know, your God, whom you serve, he will deliver you. Darius said, Daniel, your God, whom you serve, will deliver you. And he went home to his bed 
he went home to his palace, perplexed, puzzled, maybe ashamed, maybe um, who knows what other adjectives I can use here, but he couldn't believe that he had been fooled. Early that morning, perhaps before breakfast, he leaves his palace, he runs to the to the lion's den, and as he's approaching, what does he say? He cried out with a loud voice, Daniel, servant of the living God. Daniel, servant of Jehovah. Not Bel, not Madok, not Nebo. Daniel, servant of Jehovah, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Ah, oh, what a relief when he actually heard Daniel's voice. Not the lion's voice, Daniel's voice. Daniel said, O king, live forever. That was the normal thing. May you live forever. Normal royal greeting. O king, live forever. My God, my God has sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth. He didn't say, I, Daniel, have such power. I was able to, to woo the lions to sleep or to placate them or to pacify them. No, he said, my God has sent his angel to shut the mouths of the lions because I was innocent. I didn't harm you. I did not do anything against you. You know the rest of the story? Uh, the king was so happy. He must have yanked Daniel out of that lion's pit and he must have given him a big, big hug. And then he did the unthinkable. He called for all those 120 plus people who had plotted this and had this diabolical scheme he called for them and their families i'm sorry it's in the bible and their families yeah. and their wives right. and their children that was the persian justice system that wasn't god's system they were thrown into the lion's den and immediately the lions tore them to pieces i wonder what darius must have thought well we know what he thought because when he saw that he was so amazed at the power of Daniel's God, Jehovah, that he passed a decree in the land that whoever spoke against God's, that uh, Daniel's God, Jehovah, would be in trouble, big trouble. Hmm. I make a decree. He said, I make a decree in my kingdom. Daniel's God. He is the living God. He is the living God. He delivers signs. He is the one who works miracles. His kingdom will endure forever. Not my kingdom. Amen. All right, I know my time is. How did it get so late? Can't do part two on this. No, no, I'm going to tell you. What, 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 what have you learned? I was going to Daniel 12. Uh, no, we will just stop here. What have you learned? Well, there are 12 lessons. We're going to put that for you right now. There are 12 points, 10 points. Sorry, I want to just summarize 10 points. They all have been already explained for you. So you just follow them on the screen for your own benefit. Amen. Number one, the name Daniel in Hebrew means El, God, is my judge. His name was changed to Belteshazzar, which means what? Bel, protect him. Bel was one of their gods. Why was his name changed? For the purpose of cultural assimilation into the Babylonian system. That was the reason, as was the others, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Number two, Daniel, along with his three friends, Hananiah, renamed Shadrach, Mishael, renamed Meshach, and Azariah, renamed Abednego, were required to attend the Royal Academy of King Nebuchadnezzar for total indoctrination as preparation for governmental leadership in Babylon. That was the way it was done. Number three, point three, Daniel successfully resisted. Very important point, dear brothers and sisters. Successfully resisted the intense peer pressure socially psychologically spiritually culturally he resisted the peer pressure to assimilate and compromise his faith in Jehovah. peer pressure is a powerful thing and that's where many christians fall don't fall for peer pressure be faithful to christ number four Daniel refused cultural and religious assimilation, knowing such a refusal could cost him dearly. 
a position of power and glory, even his life. He refused it. You know, I will not. You want to kill me? Go right ahead. Destroy me. Not these weak little Christians running around thinking they have power to do things. And the only power they have is when they're in church with a big mouth. <laughs> Fill in the rest. Number five. Daniel stood his ground. He stood his ground in all matters pertaining to his faith in Yehovah and his religious values as a Jew. How about your religious values as a Christian? Not as a Jew. You're not a Jew. You're a Christian. Do you have any religious values? Where did you get them from? Sure. From celebrity pastors who talk rubbish, who are lawless, who are sinners, immoral people who support immoral people, who glory in their shame? Or do you study the Bible and believe it? Number six, it is probable that many other young men and women from Judah compromised their faith in Jehovah to advance, to advance in the Babylonian kingdom. Did they advance? Well, we don't know. The Bible doesn't say anything about them, but we know that Daniel advanced. Daniel did not compromise. Daniel did not compromise. Amazingly, because of his faithfulness to God, God advanced him. God gave him the promotion. Number seven, the key to his faithfulness was in his determination, his determination in his heart. He purposed in his heart not to defile himself with the paganism of Babylon. Well, application, including their foods and drinks. And by the way, I'm not saying this, that you should, you uh, as a Christian, if you want to eat pork, that's totally your, your call. That's not defiling your faith because we're not under that Judaic law. However, you are free to avoid pork. I do, but not because that counts for my salvation. Other reasons, all right? So I just want you to know that. But for a Jew, it was forbidden. Daniel kept the laws of God that God gave to the Jewish people. Amen? Number eight, even in his defiance or non-compliance, even in his defiance of the government, Daniel showed civility courtesy and respect to them. Daniel was courteous and respectful to Ashpenaz and to Ariok and to King Nebuchadnezzar and to King Belshazzar and all the other kings and all the other people. He showed, like Joseph, respect, a man of dignity. He didn't go and say, oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, you're an evil, horrible human being and you know, you deserve to die and I'm going to call on the fire of heaven. No, he didn't do that. He, he showed respect. Amen. Number eight, number nine, sorry. Daniel exemplified integrity, moral uprightness, overall excellence, confidence in God, and extraordinary courage, even under the threat of a horrendous death. Specifically, I'm referring to death in the lion's den. He never wavered. He never wavered. Never budged. He was steadfast. No amount of pressure could cause him to change his faith and faithfulness. Number 10. So this is the most important point now. How about you? How about me? How about so the Christians who live today? Are you faithful and courageous? Are you like a Daniel? Have you rejected secularism, humanism, relativism, pluralism, and cultural assimilation? Or do you have you compromised with that? You know, in America here, we were, we were a nation leading the world in all kinds of moral depravity regarding many things, marriage, abortions, Male, female, etc., etc., etc. Do you capitulate to the more so to the cultural demands, or do you say absolutely never? Thus saith the Lord, and I will stand by the word of God, even if it costs my life. Do you have that courage? If not, why not? What are you waiting on? 
This is the world's culture. The world's culture is more depraved every day. And very soon now, very soon now, as I close up, I got to close, I got to close. I know, sorry, I have gone over time <laughs> significantly, but I didn't realize how much I have to cover here. <laughs> Greater challenges are going to face all mankind in the next few months and certainly in the next few years. The global conference in Davos, I think is almost over or over. I'm not sure. We wait and see what comes next. But greater challenges are ahead of us as the global conspirators gather together to plot their evil against Christ and his kingdom. The kings have gotten together, Psalm, Psalm 2, it says, right? They plot against the anointed of God, saying, let us do this and let us do that. And God laughs at them. God, Jehovah, laughs at them. They plot against Christ. They plot against his church. They plot against the Jews. They're working over time to build their empire for the kingdom, for, for, for the devil. So one, as I close, my dear brothers, be strong, be courageous, be faithful, dare to be like Daniel. Even if it costs you a trip to the lion's den, whatever the lion's den will be then. I hope that the rapture takes place before that time, but whether or not it takes place, it's up to God. But we have to be prepared for what is going to happen. And that's why this sermon is so important. Dare to be like Daniel. Dare to be a hero of faith like Daniel was a hero of faith. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for your caring, your sharing. Thank you for your praying for us. Thank you for whatever you do, your financial contributions. All those of you who give financially to keep this work. This is a ministry by faith. This is a ministry strictly by faith. I want you to know that. So those of you who give, you are you are blessing ambassadors for Christ Ministries and you're blessing us. So this ministry will continue to reach the world. We will. I promise you this. As long as God gives me bread, I will never compromise this book. I will never compromise this word of God for one dollar or a billion dollars. Never. So help me, God. That's my commitment to my Lord. Hallelujah. Do I hear amen? Until then, as always, this is Pastor Jay reminding you, be strong in the Lord, be courageous in the Lord, be faithful to the Lord, and in the power of his might. Have a blessed rest of the day. Until next time. God bless. Bye-bye. Amen. Yeah.